Uh, Acts chapter 10, as I have been saying for the last several weeks, is one of my favorite chapters. If you, uh, if you don't have it in front of you, I'm going to ask our, our slide guru at the back to go to that section that talked about well, let me see if I can get a verse, exact verse for you, because that would be, that would be easier. In 34, verse 34, then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. So I have a story to tell you. Are you ready? My wife reminded me that she had collected this for me. You are going to laugh, but be careful. <clears throat> you may be laughing at yourself. I was walking across a bridge one day and I saw a man standing on the edge about to jump off. So I ran over and said, stop, stop, don't do it. It's the right thing to do, right? Stop somebody from jumping off a bridge. Why shouldn't I, he said. I said, well, there's so much to live for. He said, like what? I said, well, are, are you religious or an atheist? He said, religious. I said, uh, me too. Uh, are you a Christian or a Buddhist? Uh, he said, uh, a Christian? I said, me too. Uh, are, are you a, a Catholic or a Protestant? He said, Protestant. I said, me too. Uh, are, are you a Methodist or a Baptist? <clears throat> he said, Baptist. Oh, wow, me too. Are, are, are you Baptist Church of God or are you Baptist Church of the Lord? <laughs> he said, Baptist Church of God. Oh, me too. Are you original Baptist Church of God or are you reformed Baptist Church of God? <laughs> reformed Baptist Church of God. Oh, me too, me too. Are you Reformed Church of God, Reformation 1879, or are you for Reformed Church of God, 1915? He said, Reformed Church of God, Re uh, Reformed 1915. Die, heretic scum! And I pushed him off the bridge. Now, I would have to do a little bit of modification to that to make it Adventist. <laughs> but you get the point. You get the point. When you look at our scripture today in Acts chapter 10, you have Peter coming to a new realization of the way in which God intends to act towards humanity. I love the story that uh, Kit told this morning, and uh, I, I'm, I'm interested in you uh, seeing that scene again in your mind just for a moment. Jesus is there, and he's teaching and preaching, and he's healing. He's doing what he came to do, and there is no one left out, except in the way that they tell the story, I guess. Because the Bible records that there were how many men? Now, I don't know if they were meaning the generic form of man. You know, human. But let's just say there were a lot of ladies there too. And obviously there was a boy. Now, he probably would have been counted along with the other men just because he was a male. However, let's just say there were 15,000. Kit's story is not far off. They were probably packed and stacked going up that hill. 
Now, I've had the opportunity to be there in, in Israel, and, and some of you have as well. And it, there is a place, I want you to know, there is a spot around the Sea of Galilee which has several rocks that go out into the water. Uh, my teacher took us there because he had an acoustic experience he wanted us to have. And he said, this maybe is the place. You know, that's what they always say when you go to Israel. If you think, oh my goodness, I am actually going to be in the spot. Please understand, <laughs> there have been millions who have come before you. And there have been those who have wanted to say, no, this is the spot. And then there are others who say, no, this. So... There is a place around the Sea of Galilee where you can hop out onto those rocks and you can talk to somebody, and I kid you not, somebody that would literally be at the back of our property. And you can talk in a tone of voice like I'm talking to you right now, and that person hears you as if they were standing right next to you. The acoustics of the water and the hillside carry your voice. If you're on the sea, they carry your voice right up the hill. So, no, you can't do it the other way. You can't stand up the hill and yell. You have to yell. And even, the, even then, the person down on the sea can hardly hear you. But the acoustics going the other way, the sound traveling the other way makes it possible for this scenario to happen. Everybody was hearing. Everybody is included. When the bread gets passed out, Jesus doesn't stop breaking that bread and, and, and putting the, I like that, kid, fish sauce? That's like, that's like F, F, B, and J, uh, fish, peanut butter, oh, okay, forget it. Peanut butter and jelly. <laughs> this is fish sauce, so fish sauce sandwiches. That, that, that probably was more like it because, you know, when you didn't have a lot, you wanted at least a little that you had to taste good. Five loaves and two fish spread over those cracker-like things. I mean, this was like hardtack, you're right. Nobody went away hungry. They were hangry. Now they were full. Now they were full. So we come to this story, this, this Cornelius story, this text that we have today, and 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 and. I'm, I'm glad that Kit told that story. So I'm going to tell you a couple more. Okay, just these are these are little vignettes, little windows that I think will add to the impact of what we hear Peter say when he says, "I now understand." The first one is the Old Testament, and 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 the one that I'm thinking of particularly has had movies made about it. It's Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. Now, Sheba, uh, or Seba, is Ethiopia today. And so you have this magnificent queen with her entourage bringing beautiful things from her realm to come and see this young man who the world now knows, at least his world now knows, is a very, very wise man and is becoming exceedingly wealthy as well. So as a, as a head of state, she comes for a state visit. But unlike state visits that we see today, this was quite an extended period of time, we are given to believe, that she stayed and watched what happened and experienced life in the court of Solomon. Suffice it to say that from all that she learned of Solomon, she went home with more, the Bible says, than she brought. Now why am I telling you this, this story? Because it is a precursor to understanding Peter, Simon Peter, as he goes to Cornelius' house. Here you have the Queen of Sheba who is coming to Israel, coming to learn about God from Solomon. And she leaves with more than she came as, because she had brought gifts, she would brought tribute. But she learned more and then Solomon gave her more gifts than she gave him. 
I bring this up because, you see, Solomon, to me, is sort of the zenith. He's, he's the apex of the, the best of the kings of Israel. You think, oh, no, 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 it's David, pastor. It, it's David. No, no, David didn't get to build the temple. You have blood on your hands, my son. You have blood on your hands. It's going to be your son Solomon who builds my temple. So Solomon builds this temple, he, 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 he raises up a, a shrine, as it were, to the God of heaven, and he does this thing in order to do the mission that the people of Israel had been raised up to do. The text says, God is, no, I'm going to use the King James, God is no respecter of persons. Really? Well, he chose. He chose a particular people. Out of all the peoples on the earth, he chose Terah. Terah. Don't think it was Abraham first. No, my friends, it was his dad. God came to Terah first and said, I want to take you on a journey. Will you go with me? He went as far as the place where his second son, Haran, died. And he named the town, the encampment of that place, after his dead son, whose, whose son was... Lot, who then when God came to Abraham and passed the mantle, passed the cloak onto Abraham, Abraham took Lot with him, the son and heir of his dead brother Haran. God did make a choice. He did single out a family. And he did tell Abraham, your family and your descendants will be a blessing. And so in an ultimate sense, you can say that Jesus, son of David, is that ultimate blessing. Peter had grown up knowing this and feeling this. But he had taken that heritage and he had kept it to himself. Even in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he pulled out his sword and cut off the high priest's servant's ear. What was he doing? He was saying, I am going to defend the one who I think is going to be king of the Jews. Have you ever wondered why the Romans put that placard above Jesus in three languages? Jesus of Nazareth. King of the Jews. What had just happened the weekend before? We tell the children's story. Children, you know the story. Clip, clop, clip, clop, go little donkey's hooves. Who was riding little donkey? Jesus. And what had all the people been cutting down palm branches for? Hail, son of David, who comes in the name of the Lord, the king of the... The Jews. It is now my firm understanding that that placard was the Roman response saying, bring it on. Anyone who claims to be the king of the Jews other than Caesar, this is what's going to happen to them. We're going to crucify them. It was the great day of disappointment for Peter because that was his horse. He was betting on Jesus to be the king of the Jews that beat the Romans. He was the inheritor of that whole idea of being special. 
of, of being chosen. And he took that idea like the rest of the nation, even after three and a half years of walking and talking and sleeping next to around the campfire with the Son of God, the Messiah, he still believed it was only for Israel. My brothers and sisters, it was only after Peter received specific instructions from God, a.k.a. a dream, with a sheet and some creepy crawlies in it, slithering things, alligators and snakes, reptiles. And he was told to kill and eat. Another forbidden thing for the chosen people. That when that knock came on the door and the servants of Cornelius, a hated Roman centurion, came and said, we are here because our master has asked us to come and get you to come because an angel told us you have something to tell us. Peter walks into that house, and if you remember, because we dealt with this text a few weeks ago, he steps across the threshold, and when he does so, he becomes ritually unclean. The Israelites were not supposed to mix with non-Israelites. And so he begins to understand why he just got an analogy vision. An analogy vision. Unclean food, kill and eat. Unclean people, go visit them. Ah, I now understand, he is saying. God is here for everyone. Now, Peter wasn't the only one who had to learn this. Uh, John chapter 3 finds us again at night. I like this because there used to be uh, a TV. Is there still a TV uh, channel called Nickelodeon? Okay. And, and, and I don't know. Okay. She knows. Okay. Thank you. It is for kids. And there is a, a, a part of it where Nickelodeon uh, does things at night. And it's called Nick at Night. Right? Okay. So this is the original that's new. But the original Nick at night is Nicodemus. Nicodemus at night. Hoodie is up. He's incognito. Yeah, Jesus probably had his hoodie up too. You know, it's cold. He had his cloak around him and they're meeting in a clandestine sort of manner. You know, kind of like spies. And he's talking. And finally... Jesus, you know, Jesus, Jesus is the one with his jaw on the floor. Oh my goodness, you are the teacher of Israel and you do not know these things? Here you have the quintessential Israelite. I mean, you could say that Peter was just a humble fisherman. Plucked from Lake Galilee where Jesus found him fishing with his father, obviously he had failed his final exams. Because the teacher would tell you one of two things when you went to uh, uh, Hebrew school. Either you uh, would be asked to follow the rabbi. Interesting, now your mind is saying, oh, but Jesus said that to Peter, didn't he? Uh-huh, he did. But the other rabbi that Peter had studied with when he was a boy had not said that to him. He had said the other thing. Uh, you, you, you better go home and work with your daddy. That's where Peter was found. But Peter is not Nicodemus. Nicodemus is on the Sanhedrin. Nicodemus is one of the greatest minds in, his, in, in Jesus' day. He, he knows the scriptures by heart. 
Then Jesus says to him, and you are the teacher of Israel, and you do not know that Israel had a mission. That is why God chose them. He chose them to show what it was like for God to live with humanity. He chose them to be the ones to show the world the plan that God had to save humanity. What have you done with that, Nicodemus? What have you done? It was obvious that Nicodemus, just like Peter, didn't matter about the education. They were of the same mindset. This is just for us. You have to be born an Israelite. You, you have to have a, a, the right name. You have to have the right family. Can't help it. It's a small parenthesis, darling. I'll only say this much. Where were the tables with the money changers set up in the sanctuary area? Ten points to the, to the Bible student who can tell me. Which part of that whole complex did the Pharisees set up their money changing operation? The courtyard of? I heard it. The courtyard of the Gentiles. Okay, so I'm not Jewish, so I can say, what? If I wanted to go and worship uh, uh, in Jerusalem, th they had tables and money changing set up in my pew, in my area. Are you feeling me this morning? They did not care about anyone else. So they set up their, their illegal, nasty little uh, exchange, currency exchange operation. You know about that, right? You could not buy your sacrifice to do your sacrificing with just regular coin. You had to take your regular coin and you had to change it into the temple coin. And of course there was a fee for that transaction. And then you had to take that temple coin and go and buy the sheep which had just that morning been rejected by the inspection man for the other guy that came to do his sacrifice with a perfect lamb. But oh no, no, it was not perfect enough and it was taken around back and blessed and then brought back, it was the same lamb. And it was sold to the next guy as being perfect for him to buy with temple currency. Yeah, that's what was going on in the courtyard of the Gentiles. No, we don't care if you're a Gentile. We, we really don't care about you coming to church. We don't care about you coming to see our God. You see, because our God is only interested in us. Because we are the chosen people. So you can be sure that when Jesus spoke those words that we as Christians uh, cling to, that God so loved the world, that Nicodemus was, was about ready to, 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 you know, to have a coronary. What? The, the, the whole world? I Israel and everyone else? Yes, Nicodemus. Yes, the whole world. God so loved the whole world that he put this plan into action that the son of David would sit on David's throne, would be part of this whole system that dated right back to when Solomon entertained the Queen of Sheba, that, that there would be a, a knowledge of what God was really, really wanting to do, and that was save all humanity. Amen. Doesn't matter if you are a human being that has you know, the ability to understand at all, you know that God is here for you. And, and, and Nicodemus, you should have known that it was your job to spread that, not impede the progress of those who wanted to come and learn. Oh, my, my, my. So unlike the time with the Queen of Sheba, 
where she was the one who came to Jerusalem to learn. Times changed. When Jesus, when Jesus died, was buried, and was resurrected, and then blessed his disciples and went back to heaven, it was now time to go. Okay, the era of y'all come to Jerusalem was over. Now, fellow Adventists, I just want you to cogitate that for a moment. I need your help because we have been given a mission. And I believe that many of us are still stuck in the attitude that people need to come to us. We are still stuck in the y'all come attitude. We have what you, we, we have what you need. You need to come see us. We understand the Bible the best. In fact, we've been chosen. Peter doesn't ask Cornelius and his family to come to him. He listens to the guidance of the Holy Spirit through the messengers of, from Cornelius' house, and they bring him to Cornelius, and he steps over the tradition that has been in his way, his misunderstanding of the mission of the Israelite people. He steps over that and into Cornelius' house, where there is gathered not just Cornelius, but his extended family and friends. And, and as you read the story, you should, you should listen to the love that God shows Cornelius. God heard his prayers. Have you ever thought whether or not that person that you think has absolutely no chance of getting to heaven, do you think that God hears his prayers? I hope so. Because he heard Cornelius' prayers. And when Cornelius had been generous in the community and had given gifts to those who were otherwise poor, God took note of that. No, it didn't come under uh, Seventh-day Adventist community services. So no, we couldn't count it when the conference asked. But I know, I know, I know that there are many in the hearing of my voice right now who are doing exactly like Cornelius and they are taking what God has blessed them with and they are dispersing it in the community. I want you to know God sees. He is no respecter of persons. He does not check your religious affiliation before giving you credit. Okay? <laughs> Peter says, now I understand. My friends, um, if, if we need to understand anything today, <laughs> when we meet others on, 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 the, uh, on, the, on the bridge of life, <laughs> and, and they're not happy with their lives, and, and they want to end it all. And we're, and, and we're too, too interested in whether or not they are like us or whether or not they believe like us or whether or not they look like us or whether or not they have the same name or heritage. If we're too interested in that, we're going to do like this story. In fact, God forgive me if I have ever been part of hurting anyone in this manner. Die, heretic, die. I mean, we laugh. But I mean, can you imagine the thoughts that have gone through your head? And I know the thoughts that have gone through my head. 
where I'm basically guilty of saying, I don't know if I want to spend eternity with that person. And this same Jesus that we have been talking about today would say to us, Nicodemus, I came for everybody. I came for everybody. Now, I'll end with this. I've been in this church a long time, all my life. And yes, I am an immigrant. <laughs> I am an African American. And my son is an Indian American. Yes, from India. He got his passport in New Delhi after we adopted him. It was wonderful. We knew, we knew the third ranking officer in the embassy in New Delhi at that time. He was a church member of mine from previous times. I don't know if you have ever had this experience where you are ushered in to the inner sanctum past many people who will be spending days and you get to be put in the back room and in half an hour you accomplish what others have wished their entire life for because of who you know. I'm looking forward to the day, I'm looking forward to the day where we will all be interested and willing and ready to be ushered in by the angels into the presence of our Father in heaven who when we pray to him we say let it be on earth as it is in heaven when you pray that prayer please mean it I know I pray to God to give me the courage to mean it if you need to pray that prayer, pray that prayer. God, give me the courage to mean it when I say, I really want what happens in my world here and now to be like it is in heaven. Not to wait until heaven comes here, but to say, I would like my world to be like it is in heaven, where there is a Father in heaven who is Father of us all, who wants us all to come home. What do you say? Amen. 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 May that be the gospel that we bring, the good news that we bring to our fellow human beings in these United States.